Okay, so uh, my name is Lisa Reiner. I work at the local food hub. Um, there is an insert in your packet from our director of grower services. It's a grower services newsletter, so if you're curious about the local food hub, there, that is a place to start um, that will show you how we work with growers and we primarily work with fruit and vegetable growers. So my specialty is fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables, but I think also I, can, I hope that I can offer a little bit of insight into um, value added items and into products such as wine or bottled beverages or things like that that are a little bit uh, not necessarily easier to make, but easier to move around than fresh produce is. Um, so this is an introduction to direct and indirect food sales. Uh, direct being those sales that originate with you and end with the eater. So this is your typical, um, your from me to you, your direct sales. Um, nobody else is, it's not going in between any other people. So you get to say, what is this? And the, the customer or the consumer or the eater gets to say, I've never heard of this, can you tell me more? Um, an indirect food sale would be something that where, where the end consumer <coughs> is not seen by you. So it, they might be far away, they might be close by, you might still know them, but it's not a direct uh, transaction where you give them the food and they eat it. Um, so, uh, so in my role at the local food hub, we actually specialize in indirect sales. We purchase from local growers and then we move that product into the wholesale marketplace. Clicker. Clicker. Um, um, so in terms of indirect sales of value added food, uh, I believe that there's a resource for you today that Kathy Kletzley from Virginia Cooperative Extension has created. Um, it is basically a digest of what it's legal to sell where and what it's not lawful to sell where. So I'm, I'm not a specialist on that, but I've just recently seen her, um, her newest version of that, which is fantastic. And so I'm hoping that that's part of your packet today because it, it really is a, a, a single place to figure out where you fit in this what to sell where. Um, so the indirect, so value added foods, um, because it's not a direct um, transaction with your customer, it is regulated by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services or, and or the Department of Health, depending upon what type of food item you're discussing. Um, I believe that success in this venue requires that you really love making the product that you make, be it growing broccoli, be it making salsa, be it growing meat and packaging it for resale. Um, because basically, if you're thinking about scaling up your operation, that means that you are going to be making more and more and ever more of that product. Um, and of course, you can get to a point where you hire other people to help you do that, or you partner with somebody to help you do that. But that devotion to the product, I believe, really has to be there because if you get to a point where you're large enough that you can just say, gosh, I, do, I wish that I just didn't have to make any more of this, uh, then I do think that, that customers and that markets pick up on that. Um, the enthusiasm will still need to come from you. Clicker. Um, the indirect sales of produce and perishables, this is where I work. Um, how do you safely grow something and move it through wholesale channels? What are the merits to that approach? What are the drawbacks to that approach? Um, in my opinion, this requires a mastery or a near mastery of what you're growing or producing. Um, and I say that through first-hand account. Um, Ideally, you will have learned everything that you know about your product through direct sales. And you'll say, there are no more surprises. I know how to do this. I'm confident. I know what the shelf life is. I know how to ship it. I know how to brand it and package it. Now I'm ready for some, for some wholesale distribution and for some indirect sales. Um, the benefits of this arrangement is that you can 
sell a lot of product if that's what you're interested in doing. You can do volume sales. Uh, the downside to volume sales is that typically they are at a lower price point than your retail sales. Although I will say I'm, I am seeing some exceptions to that, especially in regard to branding a locally produced item. There are some premiums that are available in larger markets. Um, and I would say at this point, that's uh, something of an anomaly, but hopefully our work at the local food hub is um, to focus on areas where we can get premium pricing for locally grown high product food, uh, high quality food, um, and to really sort of go after that tenaciously because I think it's what you deserve. Um, the benef another benefit is that you can realize economies of scale uh, lower price point on inputs maybe you re maybe you can you know fill up your truck and realize some savings on your delivery costs those things almost always require spending money on them um, and so they're there you can buy you know an 18 wheeler full of glass jars for your product and get a lower price per jar for sure but that's a lot of jars and it's a huge amount of money. You know, in, in February, can you plan on spending $62,000 on packaging or whatever it might be? And uh, at some point, a business, I suppose, can just do that without thinking twice. But in my opinion, it's very difficult to reach that point where those expenses aren't still very difficult to swallow, even if there's savings in there for you. Um, in terms of fruit and vegetable production, you do have the option of planning your production in the hopes of sort of smoothing your activity level throughout the year uh, as best you can. So you say, gee, I'm way too busy in September, but I don't have much to do in February. What could I do about that? Um, so those options are there. Not that they're simple or easy to do, but if you are working in the wholesale realm, you at least can say, you know, these are my choices. I'm going to work on February and I'm going to diminish in September. Um, the requirements to move in this realm, almost always you have to have an element of liability coverage on your product. This applies to value added products for sure. It also applies to fruit and vegetables. Um, and uh, you know that's a question of, of covering your risk basically if you want to be participating in large markets then your liability requirement would tend to be higher um, you also need to be aware of food safety uh, which is um, almost nobody's favorite topic <laughs> but it's, it is not going away and I encourage you to educate yourself on the basic points of food safety for your item. Um, there's a lot of resources available on that topic. Of course, there's websites, but there's also um, workshops. There are publications from Virginia Cooperative Extension, from the Virginia Department of Agriculture. So ultimately, it's your responsibility to stay up to date on this topic. Um, and then also, there in for wholesale production, uh, you do need to have some basic business skills. That is, uh, collecting on deliveries that you've already made, following up with people on payments, and the same thing um, in terms of in terms of your payments. You know, did you pay that bill for those jars, or did you? Uh, there's a mysterious invoice that you can't find for something that you bought. You, ha you have to be the one to sort that out or find somebody to work with who can do that on your behalf. And it's very important if you are investing in a bookkeeper uh, or someone of that nature that they be familiar with the food industry because there's things like sales tax, um, which you, know, you wanna make sure from the get-go that you're on the right side of those types of things. Um, if anyone has individual questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. I will be here for the duration today. Um, or if there's anything about what I've just presented, I'd be happy to answer a question here. Do you have no 